Watching from home on live stream, you're very, very welcome. And to those who have gathered with us today from the USA, you're particularly welcome. Thank you for joining with us. And as you share in the service today, we trust that all of us will be enriched and wonderfully blessed by the presence and the peace that comes from the Lord. Some announcements to begin with. The, tonight, the Glenavy Harvest is at seven o'clock, and the preacher is Reverend Ian Ferguson. On Wednesday night, the Bible class continues at 8. Next Friday, the ladies are out for coffee to eat and war at 10.45. Some of the ladies are invited up. <laughs> <laughs> ladies for coffee at Eden war at 10.45 next Friday morning. Friday afternoon, the bowling club meets at 3. And then uh, next Saturday, Craig War Church are holding an afternoon tea event at 2 o'clock. The proposed donation is £15 per person. To book uh, tickets, you need to contact Lindsay Ross. There's a telephone number here. If anyone's interested, you can get that number from Neville at the end of the service. And next Sunday, the service at the usual time, conducted by Ken Lindsay. So those are the announcements. <coughs> So we're going to uh, focus our thoughts on the Lord just now and as our call to worship we turn to the gospel according to St. Matthew and we think of those words of Jesus where he said come unto me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. <clears throat> Wonderful words, a terrific promise, an amazing invitation. So let's continue our worship. We stand together as we sing, I am so glad that our Father in heaven. <clears throat> Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, I am so glad that Jesus 
together. Our Father, those are mighty words. What a what a wonderful truth you, you've reminded us of today, that no matter who we are, no matter of the lives we lead, no matter how often we turn away from you, or run from you, or pursue our own agendas, yet Jesus still loves us. We know, Lord, he'll never stop loving us. We know he loved us from even before we were born. And he loved us all day, every day, even to the end of our time on earth. And we rejoice that that love is a love that uh, was demonstrated supremely in the coming of Jesus from heaven to earth. For his life on earth lived amongst people like us. That he's the one who demonstrated and declared how much God cares about us. And the one who revealed the mercies and the riches and the blessings <coughs> of the Lord himself. We're so pleased to be here today. So pleased to be able to be united in heart uh, with, with folks gathered together in their homes watching this online and gathered here in person in this building. And what a joy, Lord, to know that we who have been born and brought up here in Ireland are able to share fellowship with those who come from the United States and are here amongst us today. We pray, Lord, that as we worship together, that those windows of heaven will open afresh and the mercies and blessings of Almighty God will fill our hearts once more, will fill this building from floor to ceiling and wall to wall, that we would sense the wonderful presence of the Master, that we would be filled with his peace from top to toe, that we would know that it's it's us he's speaking to. Yes, Lord, we believe Jesus will speak to all of us, but oh, that each of us would hear that still, small voice, that we would know he's tapping our shoulder and whispering in our ear, and beckoning all of us to take his hand today, to follow him wherever he leads, whatever he asks, whenever he calls. Grant that this day will be a, a wonderful day in our experience as the riches and blessings and mercies of God flood our hearts and fill our lives. We long to know you more and more. We want to become like you, Lord. But for that to happen, you need to deal with all the wrongdoing we're responsible for. You need to take away our sin. You need to transform our lives. You need to cleanse and heal, restore and forgive. <laughs> So we take a moment, and in the silence within our own hearts, we make our own humble confession unto Almighty God. And we thank you for that wonderful promise that Jesus made, that when we confess our sin, then he is able to cleanse and forgive and restore. So hear our prayers, meet our needs, have your way, use us in your service in the days of the <coughs> For we do ask all our prayers in the amazing and wonderful name, the name of Jesus. And he's the one who taught us all to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now our Bible reading today is taken from the Old Testament, from the prophet Micah. And he lived about 800 years before Jesus was born at Bethlehem. And we're going to read from chapter 6 of his writings and the first eight verses. And this is what we read. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up. Plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He's lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. <coughs> My people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted, and what Balaam, son of Behor, answered. Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We'll end our Bible reading there, and we give thanks to God for this word from the Lord himself. Let's continue our worship as we bring our morning offering. I'll <laughs> ourselves. We declare our love, we affirm our loyalty, we offer all we are and everything we have into your care and into your keeping. So take all that we put on this plate, take our time, take our talents, take our treasures, take all as we offer it to you and ask you to use what we give in your service and for the glory of God. Amen. Mm -hmm.
to sing again, I hear thy welcome voice. <laughs> of the world just now and our father we all know from watching the news on the television how dangerous the world is today we think of what's going on in Israel Lord we think of the hostages still held by Hamas we think of Lord uh, undoubtedly uh, the male hostages some of whom have been shot and the female hostages probably abused. 
We think of their families grieving, longing for the release, seeking the government of Israel to do something to secure their freedom. We think, Lord, of the uh, families in Israel who have lost loved ones because of the Hamas uh, infiltration last October. And we think, Lord, of their broken hearts and ask you to draw alongside them and enrich them and minister to them. And we think of the government of Israel, the prime minister, and we pray, our Father, that you will give them wisdom to know the right things to do to bring this war uh, to an end. We think, Lord, of Gaza and Lebanon, and we think of the terrible suffering that's going on in those communities. We think, Lord, of the aid that Israel has, has prevented from getting in and how the United Nations and, and how the U.S. have pressured the government of Israel to let more in. But, Lord, we pray that <clears throat> the Hamas organization will not uh, take control of that aid will not sell it to the people in need, but those desperate for clean drinking water, that those crying out for nutritious food, that those dependent on medical supplies, Lord, that the aid will get through to those in need today. And Lord, we do pray for the Hamas and Hezbollah organization. Lord, we pray that somehow they could be touched by the Holy Spirit of God and enabled to no longer hit the state of Israel and no longer seek its destruction, but learn, Lord, to put down their arms and to live at peace with their neighbours. We pray too for the governments in the United Kingdom and the, the Republic of Ireland, in Stormont and Belfast, and in the USA. We know, Lord, there's elections coming forth soon in, in the Republic. We know there are elections even sooner in the USA. And our Father, we pray that the governments of your choice will be returned to office. We pray that the people in the various uh, countries will vote for the folks that you want to govern in the days to come. And we ask our Father that those governments will pursue the right agendas that will honour the Lord and bless the people. As the UK government prepares to unveil a budget soon, as the Republic's government also will bring forth a budget. Lord, we hear awful stories about taxes rising in the UK, about uh, things tightening of our belts, about black holes and, and, and billions of pounds needed to be met. Lord, we pray that whatever the budgets reveal, that the people of these islands will not suffer, but we will indeed be able to continue to find the wherewithal to support those in need around the world today. And we pray our Father for this church, for its congregation, for the community of Moira, for the minister of this church and his family, and we ask your mercies upon them and their ministry and through them that many, many people will come to know even more the grace and the mercy and the riches and the blessings of the Lord himself. So hear our prayers. And as we turn to your word, write its meaning upon all our hearts. Deposit its truth within our lives and enable us, because of your presence and your power today, that we can follow you even more closely. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So wee boy was sitting at the kitchen table and he was drawing something and his mummy said to him, what, what is it you're drawing? Oh, he said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the mummy said, well, I, I thought nobody knew, really knew what God was like. Oh, he said, when I look at my picture, then they'll know what God's like. <laughs> do you know what is true? None of us really do know what God looks like. And yet, when we turn to the prophet Micah, 800 years before Jesus was born at Bethlehem, there are three pictures that are painted for us of what God is like. We're going to look at those pictures this morning. Here's the first picture. It's a picture of God's anger. Now, you know, that's a strange characteristic to think of today when we reflect on what God's like. Because we we like to think of God's love. We like to think of God's grace. We like to think of God's blessing. And all of those attributes are correct. God does love us. God will never stop loving us. I heard a man say once, God loves us. Even, even when we run away, pursuing our own agenda, God will pursue us to the gates of hell, saying, I love you, stop, turn back, return. Because God loves us. And the Bible tells us God is love. That's his nature. That's his character. But the Bible also tells us from time to time that God gets angry. And in Micah's time, 800 years before Jesus was born, God got angry. And why? Because his people had broken their promises and continued day by day to live in rebellion against God. Micah tells us when God led his people out of slavery from Egypt, when he brought them through the Red Sea, when he wandered or walked before them as they wandered through the desert for 40 years, and then he brought them to Mount Sinai. And there God made a bargain with his people. God said, look, I look after you. I love you. I protect you. I guide you. I deliver you. I fight for you. And they said, we in return will be your people. And throughout the rest of their history, God kept his side of the bargain, but his people consistently broke their promises. That's why God got angry. At Sinai, God proposed, but their marriage was a disaster. They forgot their promises. They broke their pledges. They ran after false gods. Was it any wonder that God got angry? God wanted his people to treat others as he treated them. But in Micah's time, it, it wasn't that wasn't the way it was. If you take time this afternoon to read the prophecy of Micah, you'll discover the rich spent their time dreaming up schemes whereby they got wealthier and the poor got less. At the same time, the judges in Micah's day took bribes. So in Micah's time, if you went to the court, you couldn't expect justice because the system was skewed with in favour of the wealthy. The leaders of the nation in Micah's day hated good and loved evil. Is it any wonder that God got angry? That's why Micah asked the question, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly before your God? But that wasn't happening in Micah's day, 800 years before Jesus. That's why God got angry. And I wonder, does God still get angry? You know, one of the greatest gifts God gives to his people is the gift of free will. 
the gift of being able to make up our mind whether we walk in the ways of God or we pursue our own pathways. And of course, when we choose to follow God's direction, then God is pleased. But when we choose to ignore him, to rebel against him, to follow our ways, God is distressed. So when God looks at the world in 2024, ask yourself, in the midst of God's love for each one of us, does God still get angry? I looked up Google the other day. In the UK in 2023, there were 14 million abortions. Does God get angry? Think of child abuse. Lovely little youngsters. And the terrible things that happen to them. Does God still get angry? Think of drug and alcohol abuse. In Northern Ireland last year, alone, £900 million was the bill for helping people with drug and alcohol abuse. 900 million invested in hospitals, in the community care, in schools. What a difference that could make. Does God still get angry? Think of the riots in different English cities last summer. Think of the riots in Belfast, in Dublin. Why? Because people who who come from Other nations leave those nations, come here to live amongst us. They have a different colour of skin. Maybe the language they've learned at home is not English. And we have thugs who stir up trouble and want to burn them out and send them back. Does God still get angry? And what about the little children in Gaza? or Lebanon, or Israel, going to bed at night, and in the midst of the night, a bomb explodes, and they're ushered into eternity. Does God still get angry? And in Westminster, in these days, our government are debating whether or not to legalize assisted suicide. Does God still get angry. I wonder, could it be that the people, certainly of the United Kingdom, are living the way today the people in Micah's day lived long ago? Could it be we say one thing with our lips and we show with our lives something that's the opposite? Could it be that God in his love for each one of us is angry at the way we're living as a nation? If the throne in our hearts is not occupied by the Lord, if the lives we're leading, living, is not honoring him in the decisions we make, Is it that God gets angry? And if the answer to that question is yes, God does get angry and God is angry, surely we need to watch out because of the anger of God. But as well as the anger of God that is revealed through Micah, there's a second picture here and it's God's anticipation. Because you see, Micah lived roughly at the same time as Isaiah. And Isaiah had two sons. Now, if you're ever having a quiz in church, and you get, let's say, two teams, and they're sort of neck and neck, and you have to have a a question that will decide which one wins, here's a good question. (coughs) Name the two sons of Isaiah. 
Neville, name the two sons of Cain. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, it wasn't Neville, it wasn't Cain. The name of the first one was Meher Shalal Hashpah. <laughs> the other was called Shiar Tashu. You just think of Mrs. Isaiah tea time. She was out the door. Meher Shalal Hashpah. That's a significant name because translated it means a remnant shall return. So in the midst of God's anger at his people, here was God's anticipation. Here was a sign of God's mercy. You see, because his people had turned away from him, because his people had broken their pledges, because his people had run after false gods, God said, all right, I'll take a step back. If you want to fight your own battles, get on with it. And the consequences of that were that the people of God were beaten in battle, taken away to a foreign nation as slaves. As far as they were concerned, it was the end. But God said to Isaiah, Name your first son, Meher Shalal Hashbaz, translated, A remnant shall return. It's not the end. There will always be hope because of God's grace and love and mercy. God's anger would be replaced with his mercy, and the people would return from exile and come back home again. You see, the mercy of God is God not giving to us what we deserve. And the message of Micah is that in spite of the despair and the doom and the darkness of God's anger, there's hope because God is still on the throne and God's a God of mercy. Listen to what Micah said in another part of his prophecy. He said, Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. The lovely old chorus puts it like this yesterday, today, forever. Jesus is the same. All may change. But Jesus never. Glory to his name. That means, doesn't it? That means the God we read about in the Bible, the God who, was, who, who, who Micah worshipped, the God who was revealed in the person of Jesus, is the God who looks down on the world today. He's the God who anticipated the return of his people from exile to their homeland, and he's the God who longs to see the streets of earth and the world transformed by his mercy, because he is a God of love and a God of anger, but a God of mercy as well. Mercies from God means he can help us. Mercies from God means there's hope for us. Mercies from God means there's even a place called heaven. And those in heaven will be men and women who here on earth took the time to develop a relationship with God, who realized God is a God of mercy, who responded to him, who received his grace into their lives, and who invested their lives serving other people reaching out to the lonely and the hurting and the depressed and the down and the out. Those afraid, those whose lives are, are messed up and shared with them the hope that is in Jesus Christ. And because Jesus reached across barriers in his day, and because Jesus offered mercy to people then, and because folks then and since responded to him and reached out in his name to others, heaven will be full of people 
not fooled by man-made labels that divide, but filled with people who have sought to follow him and live the Jesus life here on earth. Wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be wonderful if, if the mercies of God were evidenced all over the world today? Wouldn't it be wonderful if in every nation where there's bitterness and, and division and tension and hatred, that the mercies of God transformed lives and lands. So what about you and me? Have we responded to his mercies? Have we reached out to him? When, when we've heard him whisper in our ears, have we turned to him and said, Lord, I need you. I can't live without you. You are the only one who can, who can fill me with hope for tomorrow. Mm. Oh, if you've never done that, I want to encourage you to do it today. Because the, the story of, of Micah's prophecy is not just revealing God as a God of anger, but a God of anticipation. Because his mercies are new every morning. And he's waiting for you and for me to respond to him, to reach out to him, and to receive from him. And I hope we will. But here's the last picture, and it's God's announcement. You know, we were talking earlier, uh, before the service started, that here we are the 20th of October, and Christmas is just around the corner. And I was, I was saying that uh, I remember, I remember one Christmas Eve at five minutes to five, going into a shop on Christmas Eve, and the gentleman behind the counter said, "Put on this very posh voice," and he said, "Last minute Christmas stocking filler, sir." And I said, "No, no, I'm just starting my Christmas shop." <laughs> and he looked at his watch, and I said, "No, no, no, I know you close at five o'clock, but I know what I want, and you have it in the window." So it's the great men that we can do that sort of thing. <laughs> well, I tell you that because when the very first Christmas came, remember the wise men went to Herod and they asked the question, where is he born king of the Jews? Herod didn't know, so he consulted his advisor. But they did. They knew. And they said, in Bethlehem, Ephrata, because out of you will come one who will be ruler of Israel. How did they know? Because it's there in Micah. 800 years before Jesus was born, Micah says, this Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. And so the announcement was made in advance of a transformation of lives and lands. This Jesus would come and he would change society. If you take time to read Micah, you read these words, he will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor train for war anymore. Oh, how we need that today. When you look at Israel, Gaza and Lebanon and Iran and Yemen and Ukraine and Russia and Sudan and Nigeria and how today in, in, in various African communities small groups of Christians are meeting in, in fear that the gunmen are, are going to come in and, 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 and murder and slaughter and kidnap the women How we need the message of Jesus today. I'm told that in the 2,000 years since Jesus walked the streets of earth, 
there have only been 30. Well, there's been no warfare anywhere at all. 30 out of 2,000. Isn't that scary? Nobody wants World War III. But it looks like it might happen. It looks like death and destruction is just around the corner. That's why we need to hear God's announcement again. God is still on the throne. Jesus is reigning and ruling. He's the victor. He has vanquished all the parts of darkness and doom and despair. He hasn't abandoned the earth. He hasn't forsaken. He hasn't gone away and left us to our own devices. And someday, Jesus is coming back again to reclaim the earth for himself once more. There'll be no more warfare. There'll be no more fear. There'll be no more abuse. There'll be no more criminality. Because Jesus will be seen. Every eye shall see. Every tongue confess. And every knee shall bow. When he comes back again. You know there's a lovely children's song that we teach our little ones about the return of Jesus. Somewhere in outer space, God has prepared a place for those who trust him and obey. Jesus will come again, and though we don't know when, the countdown's getting closer every day. Ten and nine, eight and seven, six and five and four. Call upon the Saviour while you may. Three and two, Coming through the clouds in bright array, the countdown's getting lower every day. Someday Jesus is coming back. The Bible says nobody but the Lord himself knows. Quite literally, quite honestly, he could come back this afternoon. Or he might not come back for a thousand years or more. But when he comes back, as that countdown gets lower, the Bible says there'll be wars and rumours of wars and earthquakes and famines. And that's what's happening today. Look at the headline. Surely that alone would say to us, the countdown is getting lower. So here's the question. Because the countdown is getting lower. Because his return is imminent. Because we're going to meet him. Are we ready to do so? Are we ready? Or do we need to return to Jesus? To come back to him as we are. To come back to him as individuals, to come back to him as a nation, to come back to him as a world. What a difference it would be. If people could only learn there's not a Muslim God or a Hindu God or a Protestant God or a Catholic God. But there's one God and he's the father of Jesus Christ. And he loves us and he calls us and his son died on the cross so that our lives could be enriched and fulfilled and transformed here and then we can go to be with him forever and forever what a difference what a difference life would bring if you and I were able to return to God today I hope that each one of us will want to do that to commit our lives afresh to the Saviour. To invest our money for God and his work. Paying for the translation of the Bible into all the various languages around the world that as yet have no scripture. To send missionaries to foreign lands so they on our behalf help people of Jesus and in our own homes on our knees to 
I go a level with our prayers as we knock on the doors of heaven and the Lord sends his blessings by way of responses to our prayer. That's the future. God in Micah's day was angry with his people because they turned away from him. I wonder, is God angry with the United Kingdom today? But God, in Micah's day, gave a, a message of anticipation. The remnant would return. Because God's a God of mercy. And then God made that announcement. The weapons of warfare will be no more. Because he is still in control. And because he's still in command, oh, that you and I today would take the opportunity to crown him King, Lord, Master of our lives. Let's pray together. Our Father, we, we desperately need you today. The world's in an awful state. We do not know what this afternoon would bring, let alone tomorrow. But we do know the one Lord who has the key to the future. The one who has the secret to the blessing and the peace we long for. And so we cry to Jesus and ask for mercy, the Lord, to anoint us and enrich us, bless us transform us, change this world, Lord, that it becomes what you want it to be. And we will give the praise and the honour and the glory unto you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're closing him. Saviour from sin.
That's our dream, our Father, to live for Jesus, to live with Jesus, and to die in his service. Oh, we pray now at the end of this worship that those windows of heaven will open once more. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be ours this day and every day until that day dawns when Jesus comes again, and then we trust forevermore. Amen. <coughs>